Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine As we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. To the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. We sing our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than it. Awesome and power, our God, our God. We say our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power, our God, our God. Hey, and if our God is for then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? If our for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? Then what could stand again? Singing our God is great. Then what could stand against? If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Yeah. Then what could stand? We 
sing our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. God is an is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Good evening, uh, listening audience. Uh, I'm Pastor Hal Cooper, and I'd just like to welcome you to Grace Online. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, doing a review or some uh, feedback from our first two uh, sessions that we had on uh, December 1st and December 8th, which was entitled The True Meaning of Christmas, Part 1 and 2, uh, uh, Part 1 being the gift and Part 2 being the, the teachings and the, the doctrine. So uh, before we get started, I just want to start off with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity to break your bread of life, to just to uh, be a part of something that's greater than ourselves. We know that your word comes to teach us, it comes to correct us, but most of all, it comes to give us life. So as we break this bread tonight, I just pray that our focus is there, that my mind is clear, and that uh, I'm submitted to your will, and that your spirit rule and reign, and that I give a, a, a clear view of who you are who Christ is, and what the true meaning of Christmas is all about. We thank you. We love you. You get the glory in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank God. Amen. And a good, good night, good evening, a kid, a good evening. Uh, I know it's just after Christmas and everybody's got that, trying to shake that Christmas blues off, but uh, we want to kind of look back into the first two weeks of this month where we had uh, the true meaning of Christmas part one and part two. And one of the things that uh, over this week that I noticed that uh, I have a six-year-old grandson, and uh, he loves opening gifts. But he's he's got to the point now that he he's at the point where he thinks that there's certain he has this certain expectation of what the gift should be. Even at that age, he's he loves to tear the paper open. But he gets to the point he knows that we buy him clothes. So he's not excited about the clothes. So when he rips the paper off and it's clothes, he goes, clothes. And then, so he gets all and then when he rips it off and he sees a toy, his face lights up. He's all passionate then. He goes, oh, this is a cool toy, you know. So even when you look at that, when you talk about gifts and you see the, the heart of a child and how they see it. But, you know, we as adults, we do the same thing. One of the problems with Christmas is that we get so much of the materialistic and the commercialization of Christmas that we forget the true meaning of Christmas. And even as adults, we'll say, well, she didn't get me no good gift this, this last year, so I'm not going to give her. We, 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 we tit for tat. You know, we want to make comparison when it comes to giving. And, and that's not what Jesus is all about. That's not what this season is all about. And, and our scriptures that we talked about, it was in First. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul had this to say, and I want to read these verses. 
the, the entire chapter, which is uh, 15 verses. And I want to center right on chapter, uh, on that last verse, 15, which uh, it illuminates everything that we should be doing in those first 14 verses. So let's, let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm reading from the NIV version. And this is Paul as his, in his second letter to the church at Corinth. This is what he says. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help. And I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Arcadia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be, for if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you had promised. Then it would be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparely will also reap sparely, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good works. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the need of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confessions of the gospel of Christ. And for your generosity and share with them and with everyone else. In their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. And this is the verse that we want to isolate on. Verse 15 says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now, that indescribable gift was the gift of Christ. It was the sacrifice that Christ feels. And this particular scripture puts in context everything, the humility, the, uh, the generosity that we show, it's, it's supposed to be a part of us. It's what makes us Christians. So let's look at what Paul says to this church. He says that, you know, when you look at the gift, you have to understand that you're, you're expressing something through Christ what Christ did when he expressed on us. He not only came here, but he walked among us. Uh, he, uh, he, he taught us. He did so many things. He's the gift that keeps on giving. We know that he was resurrected, and he's right now, he's at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercessions for us. So that gift never stops giving. And that's what we have to understand, that giving is a sacrifice. So one of the things that in the scripture Paul brings out, he says, uh, he says, He's sending a messenger. So why would you think it would be necessary for Paul to send a messenger to the church at Corinth when they were already being faithful? See, one of the things we have to understand about believers is that we need to always remind each other of the sacrifice that was made for us to understand that giving is something that, not that we do on occasion, not that we do sometimes, but it's something that's a part of us. It's ingrained in us. So we have to understand Paul was urging them because he knew they needed that. But he also understood that if he was going to, if other people were looking at us to be those people that are, are the righteous, are the ones that are profaning, pr pr uh, showing the image of Christ through us, that we are those walking epistles, then we got to be doing it. We, we can't ever be half-stepping. We can't ever get caught up in thinking that, well, I gave last month, and I've been giving so good for the last 10 years, i got to stop giving. No, that's not who we, who we are. That's not who Jesus was. We have to be a picture of Jesus to everyone who sees us. We're that light. So that was one of the reasons Paul wanted to make sure he urged them because he said when he, if he, that other church who was Macedonian, if they came there and they saw them half-stepping, they would say, oh, it's not all that. They're, they're not everything you were saying they were. See, see, Christ brags on us. 
We are his children, so he's expecting us to be the same image that he portrayed. So that is why we should always be nudging each other. Uh, hey, look, are you keeping up with this? Are you keeping up with your tithes? Are you giving generously? Are you serving? You know, we're not trying to, you know, Paul wasn't trying to be, uh, like he said, he wasn't trying to say something to them that, you know, that he was thinking that they wouldn't do it eventually. He, he knew they were still going to do it, but they still need that encouragement. Because another thing that people we don't understand is that carnal mind plays, can play tricks on us, you know. And we have to be aware of the carnal mind when it comes to faithful giving because we can get selfish. We can start thinking about our needs rather than somebody else's need. You see, what we have to understand is that our needs are already supplied through Christ. And one of the reasons we have to understand and embrace the gift that, that never stops giving, which is Christ, is that's what we are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be emulating him. So we have to make sure that we are walking by faith, that we are walking after the spirit and not lusting after those fleshly things because we can get caught up and say, you know, well, I'm going I'm to skip my tithes this month and I'm going to do this because it's Christmas time, so I, I got to spend on this gift and that gift. But no, that's not what it's all about. It's about being generous and understanding that even when we give to the poor, you know, our carnal mind might, might not understand that. They say, we're just giving to people we don't even know. No, we're giving to God. We're, we're, we're actually being a blessing to God when we do throw things for the poor. So we have to understand that we can't let our carnal mind start playing tricks on us and getting us selfish. And then another one of the things that we wanted to bring out in, in these particular verses is that proper principles and spiritual truths are essential in maintaining a generous heart and giving principles proper principles. We have to know where truth lies. That's why we have to stay into our Bible. That's why we have to understand that, that God has, has produced some things in us. He's given us his word. He's given us saying that, hey, I'm going to take care of your needs. You take on my yoke, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take on your burdens. So if you just yoke yourself up with Christ and you, you walk after the Spirit, you'll understand that those things will naturally happen. You don't have to worry about your needs. You don't have to worry about the things that you fear. You don't have to worry about your circumstances. They're already taken care of. You, you shouldn't worry about being understood. You should be more worried about understanding someone, understanding their, their needs and their needs. You should always think of someone else more highly than you think of yourself. You have to understand that Jesus came into this world as a servant. I mean, although he was rich, he made himself poor for our sakes. And that's the same character that we're supposed to be doing when it comes to the Christmas season. And the Christmas season is not just something that we do on, on when, while we celebrate Christ, but the Christmas season is something that, as a believer, we should be doing every day. It's our lifestyle. And then uh, another question I wanted to bring to your attention that, that the scripture brings out in these particular passages is that the benefits of being a cheerful giver, giver both spiritually and naturally, it tells us that God has already given us everything that's pertaining to life and to godliness. So we have everything that we have, that we need. He's already produced it inside of us to be successful spiritually and successfully naturally. We're going to have all those things. And, and one of the things we have to understand is when we give to someone, it's better to give than it is to receive because it's reciprocal. It's reciprocal. We, we, we get our rewards from uh thinking on the things of high, those eternally, those things that are eternal. And so we can't get caught up in thinking that, we, you know, we, we, oh, we got to do this again and getting all upset and doing it grudgingly. Life should be so much easier when we do it with a smile, when we do it with the understanding in our heart is heartfelt and that we truly love someone and we're truly concerned about their well-being more so than our own. So we have to understand that the benefits God will always, grace will always abound. He will always grace us to, so we can get things taken care of. So we ain't got to never worry about anything once we are following that principle and those truths about giving. Giving is reciprocal. It's better to give than it is to receive. And then lastly, when we look at this uh, particular focus scriptures of uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 5, and we're talking about the gift, we want to explain what verse 15 means. What does verse 15 mean? Uh, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. When we look at that verse, we're talking about something, you know, we, we think that giving is, is this season, but it's 
whole season is based around Christ and, his, and what he brought to the world, the gift that God gave us, his son, you know, the sacrifice that was made. He lived, he died, he taught, he did all these things, but he was resurrected, and he's still giving. What we don't understand is that it, it goes, it crosses all bounds, the things that God would do for us. You know, no matter where we go, his love would never end. He's constantly giving. It's a gift that never stops giving. It's, we can't describe the things that God has in his store for us. We know we, our minds are, are so, so uh, simplistic that we are always thinking naturally. We can never, we never get caught up in, in all the spiritual gifts that we're going to get because we're here. You know, this, we're not, this is not our home. Our home is heaven. We're just sojourning through here. We're ambassadors for Christ while we're here. But we have to understand that our goal is to get to heaven. Our goal is eternal. So we can't get caught up in all these things because Christ is still making a way for us. He's tr he wants us to be with him eventually. So we have to understand that that in indescribable gift is that gift that we can't even comprehend. But the things that we can comprehend, the character of Christ, the humility of Christ, all those characteristics that we should be showing during this season, that's the greatest gift that can ever happen to us, and we have to understand it through those scriptures. And that's a little bit of wrap-up of uh, part one, which was the gift. Now, part two of the true meaning of a Christmas is a little bit different because it deals with a little doctrine. But this is the uh, scripture text that we uh, talked about in that, that one. Uh, the second one is John 1, 1 and 4. And uh, I'm going to read it from the New International Version. That which was formed from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make your joy complete. Now, this is uh, the Apostle John who wrote this particular scripture. And uh, this particular scripture, in order for us to understand this, we have to embrace our mind around Christian doctrine. And one of the main things that we have to embrace is the incarnation makes fellowship possible. The incarnation makes fellowship possible. So what is incarnation? Incarnation, defined, is the Christian belief that God took human form by becoming Jesus, meaning God took some of him and made Jesus. The word incarnation literally means to take on flesh. For Christians, the incarnation shows that Jesus was fully God and fully man. It's essential, it's the essential part of our belief system. Uh, it, 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 it aligns him as part of the Trinity, and in many ways it forms all of our basis for being a Christian. Some of the things that we have to understand about this is that because Christ came, we have a joy that transforms our lives. So even though the incarnation makes fellowship possible, it teaches us how to be in re relationship with each other. But it also teaches us that we have a joy because we understand what it means. So we have to understand what it means. So when we look at it, the text gives us the teaching and the purposes in five stages. Those five stages are the eternal pre-existence, the historical manifestation, the authoritative proclamation, the communal fellowship, and the complete joy. Now, the first two verses give you the teaching, which is the eternal pre-existence, the historical manifestation, and the authoritative proclamation, which is the doctrine. Doctrine simply means the teaching of, of, of this belief, of our belief. It's what we believe. It's uh, the, the scriptures and the text that we stand on. And then in the, the last two verses gives us the purpose of Christmas. So one of the things that we want to understand is that it is so important that we know our doctrine, that we embrace our doctrine, to even understand what Christmas is all about. Now, to understand, when you look at these verses, it talks about the word of life, which you find in John also, which, is, which 
uh, joined Jesus with God eternal, meaning he was part of the Trinity throughout eternity. He was always there. He was always preexistent, and he's eternally preexistent. So the scripture first determines to us that he existed with God. He was God first. And then it tells us about the historical manifestation, the incarnation, that he appeared, that the invisible, the spiritual, became life, that became natural. I mean, Christ, or Christ, or Jesus becoming a man, becoming human, becoming flesh. So we have to understand, we have to wrap our mind around doctrine, what he was teaching, because these aren't things that we see. These aren't things that has substance, because the invisible becomes visible. You know, the ideal becomes a reality. So we have to understand when we look about, when we talk about Jesus and we talk about him being pre-eternal existence, his pre-eternal existence, we have to understand that he was there from the beginning before the earth was even formed. So that's the first thing we have to wrap our mind around. And then we have to also wrap our mind around that he was, through the process of incarnation, he became flesh. God became flesh and dwelled among us. And we see that in, in, the, uh, in John, the gospel. This is 1 John chapter 1 and 4, which is kind of looking back on those, but that's what he's expressing. And then it says that we saw it. We heard it with our own eyes. So the authorship of the proclamation, the authority of the proclamation is from those apostles. who they, They're not telling you something that they heard. They're telling you what they saw with their own eyes. And what makes it a, a proclamation is that if I want to write somebody's history and, uh, and I want to deceive you, I would make sure that somebody, whoever wrote it, or a proxy that I had somebody write it for me, would write it like 200 years later so there wouldn't be anybody that could say, no, that didn't happen. But you can understand that these books of the gospel were written within 50 years of the resurrection. So if they wanted to tell a lie, they would, they, they'd wait a lot longer than 50 years because there would be still people alive to say, no, that didn't happen. But, but that doesn't show up. So we see that what... The doctrine, we have to wrap our mind around that doctrine, that teaching, that pre-existence uh, of his eternity, that he's part of that trinity, that he was manifested, that, he, that he, was, he was God, but he became flesh, and he dwelled among us. That the authority that we read in these first two verses of John gives us the eyewitness account. When they say they saw Jesus walk on the water, when they saw Jesus do the miracles, they were there. They saw this. So we have to wrap our mind around doctrine See, because doctrine can be a, a form of, of it, it can be objectivity because one of the things about doctrine, it separates us from somebody else on other religions. See, because our religion would tell you that the, uh, the uh, incarnation is possible. Another religion like Judaism would say it's impossible. So you, we have to understand that we have to wrap our mind around our doctrine. We have to know our doctrine so we can understand what Christmas really means, what, what God did for us, the whole sacrifice, the whole in, in, incarnation process. But the incarnation process also does two other things. When we wrap our round, mind around the purpose, we look at these last two uh, verses, verses 3 and 4. Now, why is it important to know your doctrine to embrace, uh, to understand Christmas? Because Jesus is the reason for the season. It is just what I just said above. We have to understand doctrine to understand that the invisible can become visible. That the idea can become a reality. That Christ did walk and we, and we follow that. And we do it by faith. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. So we first have to wrap our minds around that. And then again, making sure that the eyewitness account is important. Because these men saw this. They witnessed this. They wrote about this. And they didn't, they didn't wait 100 years or 200 years. They did it within 40 and 45 years of the resurrection when they wrote the first book of the gospel, when James was written, which was the first book in the New Testament written, but then Matthew. So we have to understand that these books were all written by the apostles, and they all witnessed to him becoming flesh. And then... Why is building community fellowship important for the Christian faith when we read in verse 3? Verse 3 simply says, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. See, when we understand one thing, the whole plan, the whole plan of salvation is based on fellowship. It's based on relationships. It's based on intimate relationships. Christ came so he could have fellowship with us. 
He came so he could teach us how to become in right fellowship with God. He he was the he was the the the, the arrow that God shot and hit the target. The target was fellowship amongst his people to bring us back into right re relationship with him. Because of the fall, Jesus became the second Adam. He became the one that was going to bring us back to that right relationship. So we have to understand, if we understand uh, incarnation, if we understand the doctrine, if we understand the whole purpose for Jesus coming, we understand what Christmas really means, then we'll have the ability to build relationships among each other. The, the scripture tells us that um, you will know my disciples by the love they show one to another. So it's vitally important that we understand doctrine, that we understand incarnation, that we understand why Jesus is here and what the purpose of Christmas is all about. It's about building a community of believers, people with the same like mind, building that same belief system, but all under Christ. It's building the body of Christ is what we're doing when we say community. See, if you understand, if we understand what incarnation and what Christmas really means, we'll be really good at developing relationship with each other. You see, in order for me to develop a relationship with someone, I must first understand that person. But first, I also must understand that I can't go into that relationship trying to be understood. I got to go into that relationship trying to understand them. I can't go into that relationship trying to love them how I think they should be loved. I got to go into that relationship loving them how they need to be loved and what they're missing in their life. I got to first look at them and see and study them and be like Christ. See, when Christ entered this world, he didn't come as a king and say, this is how it's going to be. No, he became their servant. He humbled himself. He did everything for us. And that's the attitude we have to come when we go into building community, building relationship, because that fellowship is what's important, because that connects everybody. With Christ, we, he's the vine. He's the vine. He connects us to God. But we have to connect ourselves with each other so we can all be connected under Christ. So, so we have to understand how vitally important building community is. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's about building intimate relationships so we can trust each other, so we can believe in each other, so we can help each other, so none of us will be missing anything. And when, when the church learns that, and we, when we look at the Christmas season as a building block for fellowship and what fellowship really means, then we can understand what Christmas is all about. And lastly, in verse 4, he talks about this. He says, He's telling you this. We write this to make your joy complete. See, he's writing it so our joy can be complete. So what, what we have to understand about joy, he's not talking about the type of joy that when we giggle and everything is all happy, go lucky. No, he's talking about a subterranean joy. He's talking about a joy that the circumstances that you're going through, that the relationship, that deaths, none of that stuff can touch that joy. So he's explaining to you, if you understand what all this is all about, you have a satisfaction, you have a belief system that no matter what you're going through above the surface, the joy is still there. He, you can maintain that. He's not telling you that everything will always be good, but what, he, what John is telling you is that there are times that you're going to go through, persecution is going to happen. But if you understand what your purpose is and why you're here, you understand that your whole life is based on salvation, it's based on eternity, it's not based on the things that you're going through now, the joy will never leave you. And you'll always understand that. So one of the things we have to understand is that we have to understand what subterranean joy is and how it comes about. It comes about with us knowing our doctrine. It comes about knowing uh, how to be fellowship, how to be an intimate relationship. Because that's what building church is all about. We're building a church. We're building the believer. And this is something that we should be practicing each and every day. We, just because we celebrate it on Christmas, we should highlight it each and every day. We should always be giving. We should always be understanding. We should always be loving. There's love, joy, and peace. That's those things that God gives us so we can also share our patience, our kindness, and our goodness with people around us. But he also gives us faithfulness, meekness, and temperance for us to make sure we can maintain our control. Make sure we contain our control because our control is based on how we're going to relate to each and every one. If we can keep ourselves safe, if we can keep ourselves with the philosophy of what Christmas really means, we can grow the church. 
And I, and I hope this has helped you guys. Uh, I just wanted to give a little review on those, those first two. And I thank you for uh, listening tonight. And I just hope uh, 2022, you'll be able to express Christmas each and every day of night of 2022. I thank you. Uh, just want to pray us out before we leave. And I just want to thank you for your listening audience tonight. And just hopefully that you got some from this and that God will continue to grow you and increase you in the revelation of what Christmas really means. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, just thank you again for this night. Just thank you for this opportunity to break your bread. You're so special, Lord. You sent a Savior into this world when we didn't, you did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. But you not only sent him here as a gift of sacrifice for us to, to save us, to give us his abundant life, but you, you gave us a model. You gave us someone to emulate. You gave us uh, the role model. You gave us his character. Not only that, you put his spirit inside of us to guide us and to lead us to all truth so we can form that community, so we can have that subterranean joy, the joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. So, Father, as we close this message in this year of 2022, we just pray that everything that we do in 2022 is for you. As we close 2021 and we open up the, the new gates of 2022, we pray that everything we do, we do for you and that you get glory in our life. Again, you get glory in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Oh,